Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to Conversations in the Digital Age. Our program this week is about justice and memory, justice and memory in the context of the Holocaust, the murder of six million Jews during World War II. With us is an expert on law and the Holocaust. He is Frank Turkheimer. Frank Turkheimer is a law professor. He's a former prosecutor. He's a superb lawyer, and he's the author of a brilliant new book entitled The Forgotten Crimes of the Holocaust. Frank, we're delighted to have you with us. Good to be here, Jim. Thank you. Well, um, uh, first, I'd uh, like to ask you about your book, congratulate you on it, and uh, tell us why you wrote it. Well, I, I and my co-author, we each wrote about five trials, and our, uh, our main purpose was just to bring to the public the facts of the Holocaust to the, as they are shown in the trials. Uh, as, the, as the survivor generation comes to an end, and even as the perpetrators come to an end, uh, what's, what's going to be here to let us know what happened? And uh, I think that the trials are a fantastic source of fact to educate the next generation as to what happened. And why do you call them the forgotten trials? Well, because if you ask most people about Holocaust trials, uh, and even educated people, I think they'll tell you about the first Nuremberg trial, many thinking that's the only one, and Eichmann. And much has been written about those, but there are other trials uh, that are way beneath the public radar, and those are, we picked some of those to write about. Now, it's uh, 70 years uh, since the end of uh, World War II and the liberation of Auschwitz. Uh, is it uh, something that has uh, become a little shop-worn, uh, discussions of the Holocaust, uh, trial, there are two trials now, contemplated in Germany of uh, guards at Auschwitz. Uh, they're both in their 90s. Uh, one is an uh, uh, aged widower. Uh, does it make any sense to continue this, well, in your view? Well, you know, there's no statute of limitations for murder. That's right. And there's a reason for that. And uh, that's, that's a reflection of a social, a social norm. And therefore, when you're dealing with murder, you can prosecute it at any time. You may recall here in the United States, we prosecuted one of the men responsible for the three civil rights murderers in 1965. That was prosecuted in 2005, 40 years later on. Uh, murder is, uh, there is no statute of limitations. And when it's mass murder, that's even more compelling. Uh, and what do the trials and the, and the dispositions uh, accomplish, Frank? Uh, is it vengeance? Is it retribution? Or is it something else? Well, you know, you, you, you can't get justice from mass murder in the sense that the, the punishment fits the crime. You can't execute somebody 6,000 times if you killed 6,000 people. I mean, the closest we can do is whatever the maximum penalty is. And uh, that's, I think, that's, that's what one aims at in these trials. And it's also uh, just the, uh, there's, a, there's a need to bring the facts out, to, to have the facts come out. And they do in trials. Uh, in the case of uh, the Nazis, by 1945, uh, a number of the ringleaders, uh, Hitler, Himmler, uh, Goering, others had committed suicide. Not Goering. Goering was tried, but he committed suicide before he was executed. Uh, and uh, the, uh, But a number of others had died, uh, assassinated, and Heydrich was assassinated. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, ones who were, uh, who were brought to justice uh, were uh, certainly not all the killers. Uh, so uh, do you really achieve uh, uh, justice by dealing with uh, those who are responsible at a lower level? Well, that's something that it bears on punishment. I mean, if, if they were truly lower level people, you know, you've, we've both been prosecutors. We know we've had cases where the main person wasn't around. We prosecuted the others and let their role affect their sentence. One of the trials that you deal with in the book, it's really a, a horrific story, is the trial of the so-called Einsatzgruppen. Uh, uh, one, that was an offshoot, uh, perhaps, of the Nuremberg uh, trials, uh, which weren't specifically focused on the Jews. Uh, this one was. Uh, tell us about that. Well, after a couple of trials that had taken place in Nuremberg, after the first one, uh, one of the investigators discovered in Berlin a series of documents which showed the murder of, when you added up all the documents, was approaching one and a quarter million Jews. And these murders were, were committed by the, the, so these Einsatzgruppen, who were bands of SS men 
that followed the German army eastward across Russia or the Soviet Union. And when they came across little hamlets, they rounded up Jews and they, they, they shot them. Now, 1.1 million Jews, that's uh, more than perished at Auschwitz. Actually, more, the Einsatzgruppen killed more Jews than were killed in any of the concentration camps. Obviously, not the sum of the concentration camps, but any one, that's right. And it was largely bullet by bullet. And, these and then they were left in mass graves. They were left in mass graves, yes. Can you describe in a little more detail, perhaps with, uh, by reference to uh, uh, an affidavit of someone who was almost a victim of uh, what, what happened? Well, you know, the, the, the trial itself was looked at from the, perp from the perpetrator point of view, and all these documents were put in showing mass murders, and the, doc the authenticity of the documents wasn't challenged. And the main defense was following orders. But what, I, what, what I've done in the book is be, I try to show this from the victim end. And if you don't mind, can I show, read a little yes, bit of the please. testimony? This is the testimony of a, a woman. And you might say, how do you survive this? Well, if you can imagine you're an SS officer and you keep shooting people in the back of the head, you know, if once in 500 times, instead of hitting them in the back of the head, you graze the head, the person's going to fall forward into the pit, but the wound is superficial and survive. And if this happens once in 500 times and there's one, one and a quarter million people who are shot this way, you're going to get about 2,500 people in the pit who are not dead. Some will come out, some will be killed during the war, but a handful will survive and she's one of them. And Her we're name, talking men, women, and children. Men, right? women, and children, you know, well. All non-combatants, all civilians. All civilians simply living in small towns as Jews. When we arrived at the place, she describes how they were rounded up in the summer of 1942. Uh, we saw this was the, testimony, by the way, at the Eichmann This trial. was testimony at the Eichmann trial. I doubt that the prosecutors in Nuremberg even had access to this. I mean, things were pretty chaotic. And so this is testimony 15 years later on, but of course it describes it from the victim perspective, which they didn't have at Nuremberg. Uh, they, were take, they were forced to either get onto a truck or run after the truck. And she says when we got there, we saw naked pe people standing there, so we thought maybe they were going to be tormented, but that wasn't the case. It was difficult to hold the children. They were shaking. We took turns. Parents took children. They took other people's children. This was to help us get through it, to get over with it, and not see the children suffer. How did you survive this killing? She explains, they were lined up, we were naked. Our clothing was taken away. My father didn't want to address com completely and kept on his underwear. When he was lined up for the shooting and was told to undress, he refused. We begged him, take off your clothes, and he didn't. The Germans tore it off and shot him, and he fell into the pit. They took her mother. She didn't want to go, wanted us to go first, yet we made her go first. They grabbed her and shot her. There was my father's mother, who was 80, with two grandchildren. My father's sister was also there. They were all shot, and then came my turn. Uh, the SS man tore my child away from me. I heard her last cry and he shot her. Then he turned me around and shot me and I fell into the pit. She des describes how she was in the pit, heard more shots, people were screaming and she struggled to get out. And uh, uh, she's asked, what did you have on your head? And she shows the court the scar that she has on her head. And when she get out, she says, I dragged myself over to the grave and wanted to jump in. I thought it would open up and let me fall inside. I envied everyone for whom it was already over while I was still alive. What should I do? Where should I go? And then she says, nowadays, when I pass a water fountain, she sees it as red because of what happened there. And then she explains that uh, she survived uh, in a forest with Jews and then went on to Israel. And what you have to do is you take this incredible story. Her name was Rivka Yoselevska. Rivka Yoselevska. When you have to take this on this incredible story and multiply it by about 100,000 to get a sense of what these defendants did. And their main defense uh, was following orders. You mentioned that. Tell about following orders. Well, first of all, the court observed that even under German law, if an order is blatantly illegal, you are not supposed to follow it. But aside from that, as a factual matter, it was shown that none of these defendants had to follow orders. It was interesting how it came out in one case, uh, a defendant was being cross-examined, it's a, like a second level defendant, third, third level defendant, and he was being asked, was your superior drunk, was he drunk? And the guy thought the prosecutor was trying to show that he took over because the superior was drunk. And he said, oh no, if he had been drunk, the guy in charge, a man by the name of Ollendorf, would have sent him right back to Berlin. 
oh, you mean if the idea of shooting eight-year-olds eight year in the back of the head isn't what you wanted to do, all you have to do is drink a half bottle of schnapps? Uh, the evidence showed that at the beginning of all of these, the commanders told the SS men what they were going to do. And if they didn't want to do it, they should just step forward and they were sent back to Berlin and they were probably just went into the German army. And there was one defendant, a man by the name of Graf, who refused to do it. Uh, and he was sent to the brig for a few days and then sent, uh, sent to Berlin and the court acquitted him of uh, crimes against humanity. So nobody had to follow orders. Now, there were originally 23 defendants. One committed suicide. So well, what was the disposition with regard to the 22? There were three judges on the court, all American. Uh, the chief judge, Musamano, was from Pennsylvania. He was a judge. Right. There were two others from the south. Uh, and what were the dispositions? Originally, 14 of these 21, 23 defendants, or 22 defendants, were sentenced to death and the rest of prison terms, except for the one guy who was really sentenced to time served. Uh, the, uh, the penalty, the sentences were reviewed, were reduced somewhat, but then came the Cold War. And there was intense pressure on the Americans by the Germans uh, to, you know, to, 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 to lighten up. And uh, Germany, what I, I, say, I say, they played the Soviet card. They said, look, we're a bulwark. If we're a, we're a bulwark against Soviet expansion, uh, if you want us to be strong, you've gotta, we've got to accommodate our, what our people want, and they want these defendants out. And so four were hung, including the leader, General Ohlendorf. But by 1958, about 10 years after the trial, they were all released. All released. All released. And, and some lived for quite a, quite a long time that, after that. That was justice in the Einsatzgruppen case. That was justice in the Einsatzgruppen let's, case. Let's turn to Eichmann, which you don't fully cover in your book, but you mention it. Uh, tell about the Eichmann trial, because you spent two and a half days interviewing the Eichmann prosecutor, Gabriel Bach. Yes. Uh, and a videotape has been, uh, has been made of that. Uh, and uh, you can find it online at uh, cargocollective.com forward slash Eichmann uh, prosecutor interview. And it's a brilliant interview. Thank and, you. Uh, tell us about that. Well, I, like many people of my generation, I first l learned and followed the Eichmann trial by reading Hannah Arendt's book, Eichmann in Jerusalem. And, you know, respecting her as one of the great intellects of mid-20th century. Uh, I think she was part of a, some of her stuff was in a college curriculum, Origins of Totalitarianism. I, you know, I bought it. And then about, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 years ago, I was uh, at a talk here given by Bach in which he described some of the facts of the Eichmann trial. And that was just totally inconsistent with, with Hannah Arendt. At one point, she, she said that Eichmann was more clown than monster. And when you read the transcript, that that is an abomination. I mean, maybe in 1961, sitting in the glass booth, trying to wriggle his way around documents that were deadly, he looked foolish. But the Eichmann that we gotta talk about is not the Eichmann sitting in the glass booth in 1961, but the man back between 1941 and 45, who as you went through the German hierarchy, was the highest person whose sole responsibility was implementing what the Germans aptly called the final solution to the Jewish question. Which was at times called Operation Eichmann by the Germans. Yeah, some of them did, yeah. And, you know, I, you know in, in this uh, fairly limited time, I'll just give you two examples, one micro, one macro, of how pernicious Eichmann was. At the micro level, he kept receiving requests to save this Jew or that Jew. One request came from a general in the German army who wanted a... General Keitel. Keitel who said, can you spare this scientist, his man, the man's name is Weiss. He is a physicist, he is the leading expert in radar, we need him, can you please spare him? This coming, coming from the head of the German military. Eichmann said, well, everything he's done has been patented, no, he can't be spared. And uh, he was uh, then deported and killed. Uh, the, the macro level is uh, amazing. As you, I think you know, Towards the end of the war, Hungarian Jewry was untouched. Hungary was an ally of Germany, so the, and the Hungarians did nothing organized to kill Hungarian Jews. In early 1944, when it was really clear that Germany was going to lose the war, I mean, the Soviets were marching uh, westward across Europe, and 
Americans were about to invade with the British at Normandy, and it was clear they were losing. They decided to murder Hungarian Jewry, and Eichmann was put in charge of that. And uh, to get the cooperation of the Hungarian government, Hitler and Admiral Horthy, who was the regent of Hungary, reached an agreement that 8,700 Jew Jewish families would be spared, would be given visas to Switzerland, and they could go to Palestine, and then the Hungarian government would cooperate in sending the remainder of Hungarian Jewry to Auschwitz. When Eichmann found out about this, now this is this guy who's supposedly just a dull bureaucrat following orders. Ran the trains. Yeah, just ran the, just, yeah. When he found out Desktop about that. That's top sadist. He said, uh-uh. And he immediately arranged for the deportation of those 8,700 families to Auschwitz before they could get visas. So he effectively undermined an agreement that Hitler had reached with the head of the Hungarian government. By the way, so much of the evidence in the Einsatzgruppen trial, in fact, all the evidence really in the Einsatzgruppen trial and in the Eichmann trial, uh, was documentary evidence. And these were documents that were kept by the Nazis, which memorialized and documented their own crimes. Yeah. Now, what explains that? Oh, I think it's easy. I think they believe their own propaganda. Hitler promised a 1,000-year Reich or empire. Well, if you're going to be around for a thousand years, you don't worry about sending out a document that shows that you just murdered 423 Jews in a little town in, in Western Russia. And, uh, I th and, and those documents, by the way, that were sent back to Berlin, and I have one in the book, it's like copy 23 out of 40. It wasn't like they were trying to keep a secret what they were doing. They would send back 40 copies to different agencies showing that in this little town in Russia they just murdered uh, 2,314 Jews and 26 gypsies or something like that. This was standard. And also, what accounts for these people? They didn't come from what many people believe to be the criminal classes. Uh, Ollendorf, whom you mentioned, was an economist and a lawyer and a Ph.D. and uh, Heydrich. Uh, who attended the infamous conference at the Villa Vansi with Eichmann where they uh, hatched the final solution of the uh, Jewish problem. Uh, Heydrich's father was a, a musician, a, a tenor in, uh, in the opera, and he came from a musical background. You would think that these people were, uh, would have some humanist training. Yeah, well, and yet they turned out to be murderous monsters. What accounts for that? Well, actually, just to add to your list, one of the defendants in the Einsatzgruppen trial was a descendant of the composer Schubert, which is, uh, for, as for a lover of Schubert, that's a little hard for me. But what accounts for it? Uh, I think what accounts for it is that there really was a latent, deep, underlying anti-Semitism in Germany, which was fueled very, very easily by Hitler. I mean, he had to strike a chord that, uh, you know, that, that people were happy to go along with. I th so I think there was this latent anti-Semitism and this feeling that Hitler, that Hitler spawned that we were on top of the world, we can do what we want, and, and his race nonsense was just bought by, by people who were intelligent. Look, we had a eugenics movement here in the United States, and some fairly prominent intellectuals in this country went along with it. So it's not, it's not off the had a German-American Bund, which was intensely pro-Hitler and anti-Semitic. So. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, aside from that, the eugenics movement here was independent of the Bund. And so you, you can have intelligent people uh, getting swayed by nonsense. So it's a form of racism. Uh, oh, of course. Which, uh, of course it is. Many people, unfortunately, subscribe. And, uh, I think the Canadian Supreme Court said the Holocaust uh, did not begin in the ovens, it began with words. And uh, so it's really uh, uh, this feeling of anti-Semitism which rises to a, a murderous... Yeah, and Hit, uh, the Germans, Hitler used uh, the writings of Martin Luther uh, to uh, point to the, you know, the accuracy and how, you know, that this was justified. But what has to always, come, you know, you make that statement and you have to say, wait a minute, there was one country in Europe that was vastly more Lutheran than Germany, and that was Denmark. And in Denmark, the Lutheran clergy was active as can be to save Danish Jewry. So it's, you know, it's, you can't just say Martin Luther, therefore. 
because look what happened in Denmark. But anti-Semitism wasn't isolated uh, in, to Germany or, or to Germanic uh, countries uh, where Germans lived. It uh, really was all over Europe, and uh, it didn't start with Hitler either. It, of course not. It started many centuries before. Um, so uh, back to Eichmann. Uh, uh, we have this trial. Hannah Arendt said it was banal. Uh, it turned out not to be so banal. Uh, and Eichmann is executed. Uh, what do you think uh, uh, the trial accomplished? I think the trial educated the world. <clears throat> Even though there was only 15 years separating the Nuremberg trial from the Eichmann trial, there was one very critical sociological development in that 15 years, and that was television. The number of homes that had television in 1945 was infinitesimal compared to 1961. And the Eichmann trial was televised all over the world into people's homes. And, the, you know, and I don't, I think, the, I, I think the prosecutors did the right thing. They, they, it was, in a sense, they wanted to educate. They looked upon the trial as a vehicle of education. And to make it as national, as international as possible, they made a point of calling witnesses from all countries in which Jews were murdered. Uh, and, and they accomplished their objective. I mean, so... Really, the, the message uh, that they tried to get across, on which they uh, certainly did get across, is this is the horror to which racism can lead. Absolutely. Uh, Hannah Arendt said, uh, she said, just as you, Eichmann, supported and carried out a policy of not wanting to share the earth with the Jewish people and the people of a number of other nations, as though you and your superiors had any right to determine who should and who should not inhabit the world, we find that no one, that is, no member of the human race, can be expected to want to share the earth with you. This is the reason and the only reason you must hang. So she did change her position somewhat after the trial. You know, it shows you the, the beauty of her writing, which makes her statement that he was more clown than monster all the more incomprehensible. Uh, well, another uh, beautiful writer was Elie Wiesel, and uh, he said of the Holocaust, without memory there is no culture, without memory there would be no civilization, no society, no future. Are the Holocaust trials an aspect of the memory he's talking about? Absolutely. Uh, well, I have a question for you, Frank Turkheimer. Um, some of the criminal defendants were hanged. Uh, most got off after serving 10 years or less. Uh, my question is, did the Holocaust trials do substantial justice? I think if you look at all of them and you look at all the sentences, you have to come away with an uneasy feeling that they didn't. I mean, look, of these mass murderers, people who were responsible for over a million deaths, four were hung and the rest served less than 10 years. I mean, come on. We I sentence mean, people to 10 years for white-collar crime. If somebody robs a grocery store, they go to jail for 10 years. I mean, it's... Uh, or embezzles funds from a bank or is guilty of insider trading. Right, right, right. I think uh, if, if you want justice, you, you don't really come away from these trials saying it, it, was, it was accomplished. But there was an effort made. And I, I guess in the last analysis, that's, that's important, too, that there were prosecutors around who spent a good chunk of their youth trying to put these cases together and they did so as effectively as they could and it does serve as a, as a, a notice to people that you run that risk if you're going to get involved in this. Uh, a court is bound to impose uh, the death penalty on Sarnayev who was uh, a terrorist and mass murderer in the Boston Marathon horror. Do you agree with capital punishment in cases of terrorism and mass murder? You know, you, <laughs> I'm actually representing somebody on death row in Alabama. So you, well, apart from that case. Apart <laughs> from that. I would say that in terrorism cases, I can see it. Because, number one, you're dealing with potential mass murder. And number two, guilt or innocence is rarely, is rarely an issue in a terrorist case. I mean, the, 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 the overriding fear we always have in death penalty cases is that we're executing someone who's innocent. Uh, and that's the worst thing society can do. Uh, in terrorist cases, that's not going to happen. Well, in, in all the Holocaust cases, uh, substantially all of them uh, did not deny their guilt. 
they uh, had other uh, f- defenses of various kinds, but none of them said classic de- uh, defense in a criminal case is I didn't do it. You got the wrong man. Yeah. No one said that. That's one of the very interesting things that runs through all of the trials. If there's one theme in common, it's none of the defendants denied that it happened. They said that they didn't know about it, they weren't there, they were following orders, or you did the same thing. But no defense was, this did not happen. It was acknowledged that it happened. And that's one of the reasons I think these, these trials are very important. That's why these trials are very important. Frank Turkheimer has been just marvelous. Thank you so much for coming by. Pleasure. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations in the digital age. I'm Jim Zirin. All the best. Oh, and please visit our website at www.digitalage.org. Take care.